Hello students, and welcome back to another lecture for CORE 202. Today, we are going to talk about Tocqueville. And I love Tocqueville. He's basically a French aristocrat who toured America and predicted the future. And he wrote a giant chunk of a book, but we're only going to talk about a little bit of it. But that said, we still have lots to talk about, so let's get started. So as always, let's begin by introducing ourselves to the author. Here he is. Alexis Charles Henri Clarel, Viscount de Tocqueville. Now I mispronounced all of that. I've never been good at pronouncing French and I'm not gonna start today. But basically he had a long and complicated name because he was part of the French aristocracy. He inherited his title from his uncle and that meant that he also inherited his seat in parliament. So he basically was born wealthy, lived out a wealthy life, had a great education, but he did a lot of writing while he was alive, and he did a lot of focusing on what was going on with the lower classes and what was going on with democracy as a whole. So even though he was a rich white dude, he was a pretty interesting rich white dude. So here is a small explanation of his education and his life. Um, basically, when he was pretty young, he inherited this title from his uncle, and he used it to sort of found his education and to take care of his estate. So he went to college in Metz and then law school in Paris and then immediately kind of matriculated into his seat in Parliament. But he was unpopular in Parliament because he was weirdly kind of a liberal and progressive guy. So the bourgeoisie king who was in charge at the time didn't really care for him. And neither did a lot of the conservative members of the Parliament. Here is a small list of things that Tocqueville was interested in and things that he was writing about and making speeches about. Workers' rights, abolition of slavery, progressive taxes, prison reform? Democracy? I mean, he would be left-wing even today. So you can imagine how that was pretty left-wing for French Parliament under a monarchy in the early 1800s. So basically what happened was they were like, you know, Tocqueville, uh, you make a lot of great points, but maybe you should go somewhere else for a while and leave us alone. And they framed it as him doing some research. Basically, they wanted him to go to America and study prison reform. I mean, they didn't really, they just wanted him to like go away, but that's what he said he was gonna do. So he went on this epic American tour. Uh, he brought his best friend, Gustave de Beaumont, again, like, I don't know, but he was also really interesting. He was an author as well. And they just toured all around America and they talked to all sorts of people and they talked to working people and they talked to aristocrats and they talked to factory people and they talked to farmers. And basically they stayed with Americans while they were on their tour and they got a pretty good idea of what was going on because he was supposed to be studying prison reform, uh, which is a very noble topic, and he definitely visited prisons, but he was also sort of low-key studying democracy because America had just transitioned, essentially, uh, from a monarchy to a democracy, and France was about to transition from a monarchy to a democracy. So he kind of wanted to see how it was done and what problems there might be and, like, how to do it. So this is a map of everywhere they went in America, and I think it's pretty impressive. I think there are a lot of Americans who haven't seen this much of America. But basically, over the course of really less than a year, they traveled all around on boats and in wagons and on horses and saw a really good chunk of America. So they came home and he wrote this book, De la Démocratie en Amérique, Democracy in America. And it is often considered one of the first pieces of sociology and or political science because he was one of the first people to kind of take a step back and think about what big picture stuff might be affecting individual lives. So he was one of the first people to do what we now call intersectionality, basically acknowledging big picture social factors, race, class, gender, democracy, science, and looking at how all of that shaped the people. And the book is kind of interesting. It's kind of anthropological in the sense that he's kind of looking at Americans like you would look at animals in a zoo and trying to figure out what, what's going on here. And he dealt with a lot and he predicted a lot. So here is just a list of the things that he said would be problematic for America in the coming years. He thought we'd have problems regarding the abolition of slavery. We did, we had a whole war. He thought we'd have trouble with an impending power struggle in Russia. We do, every couple decades. He thought we would experience isolation of the individual, away from the family, away from religion, away from the tribe. He thought we would have an obsession with material gain. And of course, he thought that there would be problems regarding the ownership of the means of production. 
And that's not what he called them because Marx and Engels hadn't invented that phrase yet because this predates them. But basically he saw that there would be problems regarding who owned the factory and who worked at the factory. So in a lot of ways, he was seeing the future. But his main concerns as he was working on this book were essentially how democracy was impacting everything else. So he was looking at stuff about like democracy in modern times, like does it still work in the age of industrialization? Stuff about individualism, because Americans are of course obsessed. Uh, the treatment of second class citizens, both workers and of course slaves as well. And also balancing liberty and equality. And what happens when the aristocracy falls and everybody's kind of even. So this book is a big old chunk of a book. He wrote down everything. So we are only going to read the parts today that are about jobs and about democracy and how that influences jobs, because that's what our class is about. But I would encourage you to read the rest of the book if for some reason you need to kill several dozen hours. So we begin our discussion today with chapter eight, how Americans counteract individualism by the doctrine of self-interest properly understood. Tocqueville was amazing at chapter names. Honestly, that's one of the best parts of the whole book. So basically, he's trying to understand how Americans deal with self-interest when they have to live in society. How do you balance the individual versus the whole? So he starts by talking about individualism. When the world was controlled by a small number of powerful and wealthy individuals, they enjoyed promoting a lofty ideal of man's duties. They like to advertise how glorious it is to forget oneself and how fitting it is to do good without self-interest, just like God himself. So basically, he is like, people used to act like they were so good, and they were doing God's work, and it was amazing. But he does note, I doubt whether men were more virtuous in aristocratic times than in others, but they certainly referred constantly to the beauties of virtue. Only secretly did they examine its usefulness. So basically, they made a lot of noise, but were they really more virtuous than everybody else? Maybe not. But when something did come up that was virtuous, that was also helpful, they made a big deal of it. But as man's imagination indulges more modest flights of fancy and everyone is more self-centered, moralists fight shy of this notion of self-sacrifice and dare not promote it for man's consideration. Basically, as individualism rises, it's a hard sell to convince people to care about other people. It's, you know, people are kind of shying away from trying to promote it because who would want that? We're only interested in the individual right now. They are therefore reduced to inquiring whether working for the happiness of all would be to the advantage of each citizen. And when they have discovered one of those points at which individual self-interest happens to coincide and merge with the interest of all, they eagerly highlight it. So basically, if they can find an example of a time where helping yourself also helps other people, they're like, hey, oh, look at this, look at this, look at this, because that's one way to sell people on helping others. He goes on. What was an isolated observation becomes a universal doctrine. And in the end, a belief is born that man helps himself by serving others and that doing good serves his own interest. So essentially, they managed to convince people that doing things that were in your own interest also benefited other people. So you were like winning both ways. You were doing two good things at the same time. They do not, therefore, deny that every man can pursue his own self-interest, but they turn themselves inside out to promote that it is in each man's interest to be virtuous. So basically, they're not saying like, don't do you, they're saying, wouldn't it be great if you could be an individual and help other people? Like, wouldn't it be great if we could combine self-interest and self-sacrifice? The doctrine of self-interest properly understood is therefore not new, but for present day Americans, it has been universally accepted. It has become popular. It is to be found at the root of all actions. It is woven into everything they say. It is uttered by the poor, no less than the wealthy. So basically, Americans have like glommed onto this and they're like, yeah, we should do things in our self-interest that also promote the self-interest of other people. Basically, they've managed to convince people to participate in like the whole by telling them that they're participating in individual self-interest. The doctrine of self-interest properly understood does not inspire great sacrifices, but does prompt daily small ones. 
by itself, it could not make a man virtuous. But it does shape a host of law-abiding, sober, moderate, careful, and self-controlled citizens. So basically, telling people to act in their own self-interest doesn't make them moral, but it does make them make more controlled decisions. It makes them save their money. It makes them not get arrested. It makes them make proper business decisions. Basically, if you convince people to make calm, sober, moderate decisions in their own self-interest, ultimately that will sort of ripple out to the rest of society. This means that we've entered an age of enlightened selfishness. All in all, I do not believe there is more selfishness in America than in France. The only difference is that in the former it is enlightened, in the latter it is not. Every American has the sense to sacrifice some of his personal interests to save the rest. We, French, wish to retain everything and often lose the lot. So basically, Americans have bought into this. We'll sacrifice a little bit of our self-interest to benefit everybody else. We'll pay our taxes in order to get stuff that everybody needs. But he's saying in France, they haven't really reached this level yet. They haven't managed to combine self-interest and social good. No power on earth can stop the increasing equality of social conditions from persuading the human mind to seek what is useful, or from disposing each citizen to become wrapped up in himself. We must, therefore, expect private self-interest to become more than ever the principle, if not the only motivation for human actions, but it remains to be seen how each individual will interpret this private self-interest. So basically, as people are becoming more even, as they're becoming more enlightened, they are also becoming more individual individualistic. So basically, there's no preventing them from becoming more individualistic. So the question is, how do we like tamp that down and still make them okay to survive in society? And he says the key to this is education. Hence, give them education at any price. For the century of blind sacrifice and extinctive virtues is already distant from us. And I see the time drawing near when freedom, public peace, and social order itself will not be able to do without education. So, in short, Americans are getting more self-interested, so they had to figure out a way to prevent that from destroying society, so they managed to sort of combine self-interest and the good of the whole, and if they can just educate people like this, if they can just teach them in schools that the good of the whole and self-interest go together, then it'll be fine. If they can't, society will fall apart because self-interest does not lend itself well to like the good of the whole. So basically they have to figure out a way to combine these two things so that America can prosper. Self-interest, prosperity, America. So now we move to chapter nine, how Americans apply the doctrine of self-interest properly understood to religious matters. So in the last chapter, we talked about how Americans apply self-interest to living in community. Now we have to examine how they apply self-interest to religion, which is difficult to do because most religions are not into self-interest. If this doctrine of self-interest properly understood were concerned with this world only, that would be far from sufficient for a great number of sacrifices can only find their reward in the next. And whatever efforts of mind are devoting to proving the usefulness of virtue, it will always be difficult to force a man who has no thought of dying to behave well. So he's saying that historically, religions have used the reward of heaven as sort of like a carrot on a stick. That they use this idea of you'll either live in heaven after you die or hell after you die as a means of convincing people to behave. So he's saying it's really hard to get people to behave if you're not threatening them with hell. So how do you combine self-interest and heaven? It is therefore vital to know whether the doctrine of self-interest properly understood can be reconciled with religious beliefs. Again, most religions are not cool with self-interest. Most religions preach the opposite. So he's trying to figure out how Americans have gotten away with this. How have they combined religion and self-interest? So he makes a brief detour to talk about how other religions don't do that. Philosophers teaching this doctrine tell men that to be happy in this life, they must keep close watch upon their passions and keep control over their excesses, that they cannot obtain a lasting happiness unless they renounce a thousand ephemeral pleasures, and that finally, they must continually control themselves in order to promote their own interests. 
So most religions and most philosophies practice restraint. No material goods, no wealth, no gluttony, restraint. And he says he's seen this in a lot of religions. The founders of almost all religions have used the same language. There's no difference in the route they recommend. They simply push the goal further away. Instead of situating in this world, the reward for sacrifice is imposed. They have transposed it to the next. So again, you're not supposed to really enjoy this world. You're supposed to like suffer through and do a really good job in the next world. That's when you get to have all of the self-interest, all of the pleasure. However, that doesn't really jive well with capitalism or America, so we have to figure out a different way to sell religion. However, I refuse to believe that all those practicing virtue from religious beliefs are acting only with a reward in mind. So you're like, you know, some people are probably just nice, like it can't always be about the reward, but I therefore do not think that the only motive of religious men is self-interest, but it is the major means used by religions themselves to guide men. And I am quite sure that is how they seize the minds of the crowd to court popularity. So he does acknowledge like, yeah, the, the point of religion is not necessarily only waiting until you die to find out your reward, but it sure does work, doesn't it? So that brings us to American churches. But some American preachers return constantly to this world and have some difficulty in detaching their gaze from it. So as to touch their listeners more profoundly, they show them every day how religious belief is beneficial to freedom and public order. It is often hard to know from listening to them whether the main intention of religion is to obtain everlasting joy in the next world or prosperity in this. So again, in other religions, they're pushing reward to the afterlife, but he started to notice that in American Christianity, they're pushing reward to the present life. They're starting to combine the concept of being religious with the concept of being wealthy, with the concept of enjoying current world. So he says, not only does self-interest guide the religion of Americans, but they often place their interest in following it in this world. So he's seeing something that he has not seen before. He is seeing religion, specifically Christianity, used to promote this life, this world. And that means that you don't have to wait for heaven to be self-interested and happy and material. You can do it right now. And somehow that is okay with God. So he is looking at exactly the same thing Weber was looking at. This should sound familiar, right? He has noticed that the American Protestants have figured out how to combine being rich and being good with God. And nobody else has done this, so that's kind of a unique American tradition. So now he's going to continue these thoughts about self-interest. So he's figured out how Americans combined self-interest in living in community, and he's figured out how Americans combined self-interest in religion. And so now he's like, what are they doing with all this self-interest? Now that they're obsessed with making money and being individuals, what do they do? And what they do is buy stuff. The Taste for Material Prosperity in America, Chapter 10. In America, the passion for material prosperity is not always exclusive, but it is general. If everyone's experience of it is different, nevertheless, it is felt by all. All men are preoccupied with the need to satisfy the slightest of their bodily needs and to provide for the little conveniences of life. So basically, no matter how much money you have, you're still obsessed with buying stuff. He looks around and he's like, every American seems like obsessed with their creature comforts. Like, why are they just constantly buying stuff? And he says, it's part of a bigger thing. This part gets kind of philosophical. What most sharply stirs the human heart is not the quiet possession of a precious object, but the as yet unsatisfied desire of owning it and the constant fear of losing it. So he thinks that Americans are obsessed with material goods, but they're not just obsessed with like having them and just kind of quietly owning them. They're obsessed with always wanting more and then obsessed with always wanting to keep what they do have. So they're obsessed with stuff, but like in an active way, they're obsessed with getting more, 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 and they're obsessed with keeping all of it like a little dragon. This is different, he says, than the way that he's used to seeing it. 
because basically he came from an aristocracy and he's like you know the people i know that have money are like cool with it they're like really chill about it in aristocratic societies the wealthy have never known any state other than their own thus they do not dread change and can scarcely conceive of anything different material prosperity does not constitute their aim in life but just a way of living they take it as part of their existence and enjoy it with no further thought. So he's like, the way that Americans are obsessed with their money is way different than the way that aristocrats are just not obsessed with their money. They've never been poor. They've never been anything but this. So they don't worry about it. If you have a lot of something and you've always had a lot of something, you just don't think about it that much. In nations where an aristocracy dominates and immobilizes society, the people end up by becoming accustomed to poverty as the wealthy do to rip their riches. The latter are not preoccupied with material prosperity because they already enjoy it without any effort. And the former give no thought to it either because they have given up hope of ever acquiring such a thing or have too little knowledge of it to wish to possess it. So basically in France, nobody was this obsessed with money. The rich people already had plenty and the poor people never anticipated having any so they didn't even care. So like, again, in France, everybody was like, meh. But in America, everybody is obsessed. And he thinks this is down to social classes. When distinctions of class are blurred and privileges abolished, when patrimonies are divided up and education and freedom spread, then the poor man's imagination conceives of the desire to obtain. And the rich man's mind is overtaken by the fear of losing it. So basically, once we all start to even out, the poor people start to imagine a world in which they have creature comforts too. And the rich people start to imagine a world in which they might lose their creature comforts. So because we're evening out, everybody is starting to see how the other side lives. And that's why we're obsessed, he thinks. Basically, in America, I have never met a citizen so poor that he did not cast a glance of hope and envy toward the pleasures of the rich or whose imagination did not anticipate the good things which fate stubbornly refused to him. And this is still true, right? You probably heard that, that quote about how all Americans are just temporarily embarrassed millionaires. So he was looking around and he's like, God, even the poor people assume they'll be rich someday. And again, this didn't used to happen with like the serfs, with the proles. They never assumed that things would change. But Americans assume that things will change. We are all convinced that we're going to be rich soon. Alternatively, I have never observed among the wealthy in the United States that arrogant contempt for material prosperity, which sometimes manifests itself in the most opulent and dissolute aristocracies. aristocracies. Most of these wealthy men have been poor and felt the sharp sting of necessity. For many years, they have battled against a hostile fate, and now that victory is won, the passions which accompany the struggle stay with them. They remain almost drunk on the trivial delights they have pursued for 40 years. So he's saying the rich people are obsessed with staying rich. The poor people are obsessed with becoming rich. The rich people are obsessed with staying rich. In part because they used to not be rich. They remember what it was like to be poor. They have felt the sharp sting of a necessity. So they are more convinced than ever that they need to hold on to their wealth because they remember what it was like when they were poor. That is why, he says, the love of comfort has become the dominant taste of the nation. Basically, we all want to just sit in puffy recliners and watch football and eat snacks. We all just want to be comfortable and wealthy and chill. And we can all imagine it. The poor people can imagine rising up and the rich people can imagine falling down. So basically, everyone in America is consumed with material goods. And I would argue that is still true. So now that Tocqueville has established that Americans are super self-interested, but that we figured out a way to balance that with religion and living in society, he has to figure out how we're supposed to get all that money that we want so much. And the answer for Americans is work. Why Americans consider all honest occupations as honorable. Chapter 18. In democratic nations where hereditary wealth does not exist, Every man works for his living, or has worked, or comes from parents who have worked. The concept of work as a necessary, natural, and honest condition of human beings is therefore a widespread assumption among men. 
Everybody works. We're used to everybody working. Indeed. Not only is work considered dishonorable in such nations, it is indeed held in high esteem. The prejudice is for, not against it. So not only is having a job cool, not having a job is uncool. And this probably sounds normal to you, because you grew up in an America where this was true. But Tocqueville grew up in an aristocracy where this was not true. He grew up in a world where working was okay, but kind of tacky. In aristocracies, it is not exactly work itself which is despised, but work aimed at profit. Work is glorious when promoted by ambition or virtue alone. So like, it's okay if you work, but you shouldn't do it for money. That would be weird. Thus, the idea of profit remains separate from that of work. It is no use knowing that they are an actual fact joined because tradition keeps them apart. So like in the French aristocracy, it was okay if you had a job, like you could be part of parliament or like raise racehorses or something, but you shouldn't be obsessed with earning money. That would be super tacky, but in America. But in democratic societies, these two ideas are always visibly linked. Since the desire for prosperity is universal, since each man needs to increase his resources or create fresh ones for his children, everyone sees very clearly that profit is, if not entirely, at least in part, what prompts them to work. So Americans are not embarrassed about their desire for profit. They are only interested in profit. They love profit. In part because they want to take care of their children, but in part because there's just like no shame in loving profit. As soon as work seems to all citizens as an honorable necessity for the human race, and is always clearly performed, at least in part for payment, then the wide gap which used to separate different professions in aristocratic societies disappears. So now that everybody is working for profit, everybody is in a way kind of the same. This gap between people who were just kind of like working for fun and people who are working to survive is not as wide as it was in an aristocratic society. American servants do not believe that they are degraded for working, since everyone around them is working. They do not feel humiliated by the idea of receiving a wage, for the President of the United States also works for a salary. He is paid for giving orders as much as they are paid for receiving them. So basically, in an aristocracy, the only people who had jobs were the poor people. But in this democracy, everybody has a job. No shame in having a job. President has a job. Janitor has a job. Everybody has a job. Which means that occupations are honest. In the United States, professions are more or less laborious, more or less lucrative, but never higher or lower. All honest occupations are honorable. So basically, no matter what job you have, as long as it's an honest occupation, you're not a thief or something, that's okay. It is in no way embarrassing to work for a living. And again, this probably sounds familiar to you, but it was really, really different from the way that the aristocracies have been doing it. So now that every American has a job, what kind of jobs do they have? And Tocqueville thinks we pick our jobs based on the results we want from those jobs. What gives almost all Americans a preference for industrial occupations? Chapter 19. So his thesis statement is pretty much up front. Almost all the tastes and habits inspired by equality naturally lead men towards commerce and industry. So essentially, now that we're all becoming more equal and we want all those material goods and creature comforts, we need to figure out how to earn money fast. And he says that means we turn to industry. The cultivation of the ground promises an almost certain result for his efforts, but a slow one. Gradual and laborious is the path to wealth. So like farming works, but it's slow. You gotta like plant stuff and then you gotta wait for it to grow and then you gotta harvest it. And it takes a long time to like really build up wealth if you're farming. So instead, his choice is made. He sells his field, leaves his house and embarks upon some risky but profitable profession. So basically all the Americans are leaving the farm for the city. Democracy, therefore, does not simply multiply the numbers of workers. It leads men into one type of work rather than another. While it gives them a distaste for agriculture, it does direct them toward commerce and industry. 
So as we level out, we all want to make as much money as fast as possible. And the best way to do that is the Industrial Revolution. In democratic countries, however rich a man is thought to be, he is almost always dissatisfied with his wealth. Because he is less rich than his father was and fears his sons will be less rich than himself. So again, he's talking about how we are just obsessed. We are evening out our levels of wealth, but that doesn't mean we're happy. We still want more, 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 more. Which leads us to the ways to wealth. The majority of the rich in democracies ceaselessly ponder, therefore, the ways to wealth and naturally turn their gaze towards trade and industry, which seem to them to be the quickest and the best way of obtaining it. Yeah, that's right. Get rich quick schemes are not new. Americans have kind of always been obsessed with getting rich as fast as possible. And that leads us to an obsession with commerce. In democracies, nothing is greater or more brilliant than commerce. It attracts the eyes of the public and fills the imaginations of the crowd. All passions and energy are directed toward it. There is nothing to stop the rich from engaging in it, neither their own prejudices nor those of anyone else. So basically, everyone is obsessed with commerce. Everyone is obsessed with industry. We're not just chilling on the farms anymore, making do, taking care of ourselves. We want money. And the best way to make money and the fastest way to make money is in the cities and in industrial production. And not only are the poor people who want to make money obsessed with it, the rich people who want to make more money are also obsessed with it. Those living in the instability of a democracy have the constant image of chance before them. And in the end, they come to like all those projects in which chance plays a part. They are therefore all led to commerce, not only because the promise of profit, but because they like the emotions invoked. So he is arguing that democracies are inherently unstable. And in a sense they are, right? We elect a new person every four years, that's pretty unstable. But at the same time, he's saying, maybe we like that instability. Maybe Americans like this game of chance. Maybe we don't want to invest in something boring that will return 1% a year. Maybe we want to invest in something risky and get big returns. Maybe it's very American to try something dangerous. And he says, you know, this might be because we're so young. It is only 50 years since the United States emerged from the colonial dependence in which England held it, right? So he was only in America about 50 years after the revolution. The number of great fortunes is still very small, and capital is still scarce. Yet, no nation of the earth has made such swift progress in trade and industry as the Americans. And this is true. Americans were uniquely primed to embrace the Industrial Revolution. We all wanted jobs. We all wanted to get rich. We all wanted to participate in industry. We were not content chilling on our farms. We want in on the big money. So basically, in the United States, the greatest industrial projects are completed without trouble because the entire population is engaged in industry and because the poorest and richest citizens are ready to unite in their efforts to this purpose. Americans make great progress in industry because they are all engaged in it at once. For the same reason, they are subject to very unexpected and formidable crises, which we'll talk about in a second. But basically, Americans are making huge progress. They're building giant factories. They're producing all of this stuff in part because they're all participating. Everyone is trying to build. Everyone is trying to make money. And that means things are happening at a huge scale. So basically, he thinks industrialization is a huge part of the American dream. So you may have noticed that in that last slide, he predicted that everyone being involved in industrialization could actually have negative impacts too. So that's what he's going to address in this chapter. How an aristocracy may emerge from industry. Chapter 20. I have shown how democracy fosters industrial development and multiplies without limit the number of industrialists. We shall see by what out of the way road industry could in its turn bring men back to aristocracy. So he's saying that he showed how industry could kind of level the playing field. It could allow a lot of people to make a lot of money, regardless of who their parents were. But he also thinks that it could bring us back to restrictive class structures. 
When a craftsman is constantly and solely engaged upon the making of one single object, he ultimately performs his work with unusual dexterity. This should sound familiar. Remember Adam Smith earlier this semester? You remember. But at the same time, he loses his general capacity to apply his concentration on the way that he is working. So as we engage in the division of labor, as we get more and more and more specialized, we get super dexterous, super good at our one thing, but we might lose our capacity for the big picture. So he says, when a workman has spent a considerable part of his existence in such a manner, his thoughts are forever taken up by the object of his daily toil. His body has contracted certain fixed habits which it cannot discard. In short, he no longer belongs to himself, but to the profession he has chosen. So once you get so absorbed in your work, sometimes you just become obsessed with it. You think about your work when you're not at work, you dream about your work, your muscles ache from the kind of specific work you're doing. It's very much like that scene in the Chaplin movie where he can't stop screwing bolts. And he says this might actually cause us to slip backwards. As the principle of the division of labor is applied more completely, the worker becomes weaker, more limited, and more dependent. The craft makes progress, the craftsman slips backwards. So Adam Smith did point this out. This is one of the dangers of the division of labor. Basically that you become so specialized that you can't do anything else. You become a garage that only fix one kind of car. And there are so many other kinds of cars. Why can't you just fix cars, period? And you can't because you're very specialized. So he is saying that this might actually be dangerous. We are obsessed with our work. We identify with our work, but we only know one little narrow thing. While the worker, more and more, restricts his intelligence to the study of one single detail, the boss daily surveys an increasing field of occupation, and his mind expands as the former narrows. Soon, the one will need only physical strength without intelligence. The other needs knowledge and almost genius for his success. The one increasingly looks like the administrator of a vast empire, the other a brute. So this is kind of harsh, but basically what he's saying is as we get more and more narrow, we become kind of more and more useless. The boss still knows the big picture. He still knows how all the pieces fit together, but the worker is basically a brute. He's not, Anticipating robotization, but that's essentially what he's anticipating in part. Like as the worker becomes more and more specialized, they become essentially a brute. They could just as easily be a machine. So the worker is losing sight of the big picture. The boss still has the big picture. And he's saying that that might actually make the worker dumber because they don't have to think about things as hard while it makes the boss smarter because they have to think about everything all at once. Maybe. So then he says, so the employer and the worker share nothing in common on this earth, and their differences grow daily. They exist as two links, each at the end of a long chain. Each holds a place made for him from which he does not move. The one is dependent on the other. So they're still tied together, and they still move when the other moves, but they don't interact with each other. Their jobs are so different now that they basically have no points of contact. And this means that they might have kind of worked themselves back into a class struggle. The dependency of the one has upon the other is never ending, narrow and unavoidable. The one is born to obey as the other gives orders. What is this if not aristocracy? So essentially, he's saying if you are the brute, uh, you know, the machine, the cog in the wheel, you exist just to be told what to do. Like, sure, you're participating in industrialization, but you're participating at a really low level. You didn't even know what else is happening in the rest of the company. The boss does know what's happening. He's the one that gives orders. All you do is follow orders. So in a sense, isn't that just aristocracy all over again? He's like, isn't this just serfs and kings all over again? Aren't we essentially just reinstating the class structure we just tried to leave? But he's also worried because it doesn't look like it used to look. The aristocracy used to be kind of responsible for the people under them, and he thinks that the wealthy industrialists aren't 
feeling responsible for the lowly workers, that this actually looks a little different than what he's seen before. Thus, as the mass of the nation turns to democracy, the particular class which runs the industry becomes more aristocratic. But that aristocracy is not like any that preceded it. So they're becoming more aristocratic, they're becoming more removed, but it doesn't look quite like he's used to seeing it, in part because they aren't like linked together. Not only are the rich not firmly united to each other, because they're not all like related and interbreeding like they used to, but you can also say that no true link exists between the rich and the poor. They are not forever fixed, one close to the other, moment by moment. Self-interest pulls them together only to separate them later. The worker depends on the employer in general, but not on any particular employer. So it's not like when you were a serf who lived on a great lord's land and you knew that if there was like a bad harvest, he would take care of you. Now it's like you're an employee, but you could work for somebody else. Like it, who the boss is doesn't matter, but you're not connected. You're not master and servant. You're just employer and employee, and you might never look at each other. And he thinks this could actually be a little bit dangerous. The landed aristocracy of past centuries was obliged by law, or at least believed itself obliged by custom, to help its servants and to relieve their distress. However, in this present industrial aristocracy, having impoverished and brutalized the men it exploits, leaves public charity to feed them in times of crisis. This is a natural consequence of what has been said before. Between the worker and the employer, there are many points of contact, but no real relationship. So in the olden days, the aristocracy used to take care of the poor. They felt responsible for them, especially the ones who lived on their land. But now he says this new industrial aristocracy does not care. They are rich, you are poor, who cares? They don't feel responsible for the working class, even though they created the working class. There's all these people who work for them who are poor and who are starving, and they don't feel like that's their responsibility. In the olden days they did, in the modern days they don't. They're like, that's a you problem. And Tocqueville says this could turn out really badly. However, this is the direction in which the friends of democracy should constantly fix their anxious gaze. For if ever aristocracy and the permanent inequality of social conditions were to infiltrate the world once again, it is predictable that this is the door by which they would enter. So he's basically saying, hey, listen, if y'all are worried about class divisions, y'all need to watch this. This is gonna be the problem. This is the door by which class distinctions are gonna come back in. So he's like, you thought you made this whole like equal democratic nation, but y'all need to be careful because the same thing might happen again. And if it does, this is how predicting the future. That's why Tocqueville is so cool. So basically Tocqueville did a tour of America and figured out what makes Americans tick. And what it is, is self-interest. We use democracy to even the playing field and we used industrialization to even the playing field. But the only things Americans ever really wanted were creature comforts. And honestly, I think he's right. So in class this week, we'll talk about how this played out and how America looks today and whether Tocqueville was right about all the stuff he said. So I'm looking forward to talking with you and I'll see you soon.